Good morning to you. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, I invite you to open up to Luke chapter 2 and verse 10. Luke chapter 2, and we're going to start there in verse 10. Thank you so much for your presence this morning. We have visitors with us. We're thankful that you have taken the time to be with us. If you have any questions about anything that we say or do here at University of Oaks, feel free to ask us after services. We'd love to do nothing more than to talk with you about the Word of God, talk with you about the work that we do for Jesus here at this church. Thank you so much for being here this morning. In Luke chapter 2, as you look there at verses 10 and 11, I suppose this, this may be a verse that we hear um, fairly often this time of this time of year. Uh, we're probably going a little bit of a different direction this morning than what many others are. But in Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 8, there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. And then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Verse 10 there, do not be afraid. Uh, behold, I bring you good tidings or good news of great joy. We want to talk about that idea of good news this morning. There is a lot in the gospel. And there is a lot in the gospel that is good. Messages we need to hear, messages we need to take into our hearts, messages we need to live in our daily lives. And admittedly, we live in a world that has sin all the way through it, and oftentimes, perhaps, our Bible study ends up being focused on where folks have strayed from the gospel and identifying those failures. And there's a time and a place for that, and that is good, and that is wholesome, and that is needed. But there are also times that we need to remind ourselves what the gospel really is all about and the hope that is in the gospel and the good things that are in the gospel. And we want to do that this morning. We're going to start here in Luke chapter 2. The good news or the good tidings. Um, the word gospel is composed in the Greek language of uh, two different terms, not necessarily words, but two different terms. Uh, we've got the, I, the, the prefix here, you, E-U, uh, which simply means good. We see this in our society today. If you ever uh, hear the, uh, remember Do Dr. Jack Kevorkian? Some of you will remember that. Some of you are like, Dr. Jack who? Uh, Dr. Kevorkian was very controversial at the time, right? Because he practiced something called, do you remember what it is? Euthanasia, right? Euthanasia, which means literally translated good death. Uh, I would disagree with the idea that what Dr. Kevorkian provided was, was a good death, but nonetheless, um, that's how some would see it. Or when we take our pet that is sick and hurting uh, to the vet to put them down, we call it, it's called euthanasia, right? You meaning good thanatos, the Greek word there. Uh, for death. Y'all got to give me just a second here or else I'm going to like throw this thing. There we go. So gospel begins with this prefix you, which means good. And then you've got this word agalon, which simply means message or news. Uh, you see it almost uh, looking like our English word angel, which an angel in Greek is just a messenger. Same idea here. So when you're looking at the word gospel, it's good message, good News, that's literally what it means there when we're pulling it out of the Greek. And that's why we often talk about the good news of the gospel, and indeed there is good news in the gospel. It starts here in Luke chapter 2 and verse 10, where we read that there would be a Savior. He was born that day in the city of David. He is Christ the Lord. Let me submit to you the first good thing that we find in the gospel is we find direction and we find authority. And that may not seem good at the start, but work with me here just a moment. There is something that Scripture often does. God, through Scripture, often reminds us that we are pretty poor at guiding or directing our own lives. We experience that in some practical ways in our lives, don't we? Uh, 
just a couple of days ago, a, a group of us were headed uh, to the Alamo Dome. And we were driving there right at rush hour, and we're trying to avoid all the traffic. And so I put into my GPS, I say, I want to go to the Alamo Dome and take me to the Alamo Dome. And if you know what Waze is, it's one of those apps that's going to navigate you where you need to go, but it also accounts for traffic. And so it's sometimes going to take you off the main roads because it thinks it can route you a different way that's going to get you there quicker. And so we start going to the Alamo Dome, and we're not on 281, we're not on I-10, we're not on any of the interstates that I recognize. Somehow, I told Sandra this morning, somehow we ended up on the, on the street that her house is on. And we're just going all sorts of back ways, and, but finally we got there. But if you had asked me to navigate to the Alamo Dome from my house, that's not the way I would have gone at all. And I would have been late, really, really late, because traffic was really, really bad. When I went to Columbia, and Ryan, I'm sure you've experienced something like this before. When I went to Columbia the second time, brought my cell phone. I had it hooked up to uh, T-Mobile, who was supposed to, keyword, supposed to have coverage in Bogota, Colombia. And I'm leaving from my hotel. I'm trying to get to the preacher's house because I'm going to ride with them over to services that night. And so I do what, what any young person, well, young at the time person would do when you're in a foreign country. I'm going I'm to Uber, and I'm going to Uber to the preacher's house, which is a good idea until you get in the car and your cell service suddenly disappears in a foreign country where you don't know where exactly it is that you're going, and the address that you were provided was incorrect. And now you're trying to navigate with somebody who does not speak the same language as you how to get to your friend's house that you don't exactly know where it is without any cell service and without being able to call your friend while trying to get to church on time. I could have pulled out what little hair I had left in my head. Pulled it completely out. But it illustrates the point here in, in a very very simple way, there, there are times when we are expressly poor at guiding and directing our own lives, even in the most mundane of things. But perhaps we're even worse at ordering our lives by ourselves in a spiritual sense. Remember Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 23, I know, O Lord, the way of a man is not within himself, it is not within man who walks to do what? To direct his own steps. We struggle with that. God understands that's something that we struggle with. And absent God, absent a revelation from Him, we wouldn't know. But here's the good news about the gospel. The good news about the gospel is that it gives us direction. It gives us guidance. It gives us a Lord who knows about us better than we know about us and who can guide us where we need to go. That's a good thing. Have you ever been tasked with doing something and had absolutely no clue what to do, how to do it, or who to turn to for help? How many times did we have a school project like that? Where the teacher didn't give good instruction, we're just trying to figure out what in the world he or she wanted, and there's not really anyone we can turn to, and you go ask the teacher, and they say what? Figure it out yourself? maddening isn't it it's frustrating it's soul killing but the good news about the gospel is in the gospel we find direction we find authority what a blessing it is then that we have someone who can properly direct our lives look there at chapter 2 and verse 10 i'm bringing you this gospel this good news of great joy which is for everyone verse 11 for there is born to you this day in the city of david a savior you're looking at the three ways here that Jesus is described. He is described as the Christ. He is described as Savior. But don't miss this third one. He's described as what? Lord. We need the fulfillment of God's Old Testament promises in the Messiah. We need a Savior because of our sin. And we need a Lord who can direct our lives because we can't do it ourselves. Here is Jesus. Here is the Word as He is described in John chapter 1 who comes and reveals the Father to us and reveals the truth to us. Remember John 14 and verse 6, I am the way, the 
truth, Jesus says, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. It's through Jesus and his lordship and his authority that we learn what God would have us to do and what God would have us to be. That's the good news about the gospel. But there's direction and authority for us. But not only that, look at Matthew chapter 26. There is the importance of little things. Matthew chapter 26, look here with me. One of the good news, or one bit of good news that the gospel shares with us is the importance of little things. In our daily lives, I have no doubt that, that all of us engage in sincere efforts to serve the Lord. We want to be servants for Him. We want to find our place. We want to do good. We want to be helpful. We want to honor Him who has done so much for us. But the reality is, is that we're not always going to have the opportunity to do great and noticeable acts of service. In fact, Jesus kind of hints at this in the Sermon on the Mount, doesn't he? When he talks about not letting our right hand know what our left hand is doing, and he talks about doing things in a closet and doing things not to be seen of men, the reality is there are going to be lots of times when our service to God is going to be accomplished not in public, but in private. But what a blessing then that the Lord reassures us that these little acts of service, done perhaps under the, the, the sight of no one else but us and God, that those little acts of service are just as important as the loud and noticeable ones that occur in everyone else's sight. You hear in Matthew 26, uh, this story here of Jesus being anointed. A woman in verse 7 came to Jesus having an alabaster flask of very costly fragrant oil. She poured it on his head as he sat at the table. The disciples saw it. They were indignant. Why this waste, this fragrant oil might have been sold for much and given to the poor? Another gospel writer tells us Judas is saying that not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he wanted to line his pockets with the money. But Jesus said to them in verse 10, Why do you trouble this woman? She has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always, but me you do not always have. For in pouring this fragrant oil on my body, she did it for my burial. But now notice verse 13. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel, wherever this good news is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. Think of all the magnificent things that Jesus did that aren't recorded in Scripture. John, at the end of his gospel account, says, Many more things Jesus did in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. These are written that you may believe, and that believing you may have life in his name. There's a whole lot more that Jesus did that we don't know. How many other healings do you think took place? Hebrews chapter 11 talks about uh, these great figures of faith who were not Jesus, but who still accomplished great things. And some of them, as you get into verses 32, 33, 34, they're nameless. We don't know who they are. We just know of the great things that happened. But we don't, we don't know who, do we? And with Jesus, we don't know what. But we know about this, don't we? And I say all that simply to convince us or remind us, whatever the need might be, that just because what is before us is not something grand or loud or noticeable or big doesn't mean that it's not worthy, doesn't mean that it's not important, doesn't mean that it's not significant. There was a preacher who was written about in a religious journal. He was identified as being a quote-unquote Christian leader. And the man read the article. He was puzzled by what he saw, someone identifying him as a Christian leader. And he kind of scratched his head, and what exactly have I done to be a Christian leader? He thought about it, and then he made the following remark. He said, in a church I once attended, and this is a direct quote, in a church I once attended, there was a man of tremendous faith. His wife was an alcoholic. His daughter had psychological problems, and he was often in poor health. Yet week after week, he never complained. He always smiled and asked me how I was doing. He faithfully brought to church a young blind man who had no transportation. He always sat with the blind man, helping him sing the hymns by saying the words into his ear. 
That man was a Christian leader if ever there was one. Sometimes what we think are the great and noticeable and big and needful acts of service isn't really what needs to be done by me. And what needs to be done by me is what's right in front of my face. That may be driving somebody to church. It may be driving somebody to the grocery store. It may be sending an HEB order to their house. It may be a simple call. Or if they've got the bug and they can't talk, maybe it's a text or an email, right? Whatever it is. We're looking for these little things and we're seizing on them and we're doing them because they're important. They're significant. Not simply to us, not simply to the people who are the recipients, but they're significant to God. That's part of the good news about the gospel. That there are these little things that we can do that are oh so important and that we need to be about about doing them. Let's make sure that in our quest to do the great things in the service of Jesus, we don't miss out on the many, many little things that are scattered all around us on a daily basis. How about this? Look at Mark chapter 8. And here's another bit of good news in the gospel. The gospel gives us a hopeful way to view death. Mark chapter 8, verse 34. When Jesus called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up the cross and follow after me. Now, pause button there real quick. We get the significance of that because we've read the rest of the story, right? Where does Jesus end up in Mark chapter 15? On a cross, right? We know the rest of the story. We've heard our, th that story from the time that we were little kids. Jesus died on the cross to wash away our sins. What hasn't happened in Mark chapter 8? Jesus hasn't died on the cross. Jesus is here speaking to them. But he uses the language of the cross in verse 34, even though at this point it doesn't seem that really anybody outside of Jesus himself has connected that Jesus is going to give his life on the cross. So when he just simply makes this reference to a cross in verse 34, he's talking about the idea, what, what would the average person have seen here? It's a reference to death, isn't it? This was capital punishment. This is how the Romans quelled insurrections. This is how they reminded people who was in charge and to keep your place and to hold your tongue. There were some cities uh, over which Rome ruled that when insurrections would happen, they would take the, the insurrectionists and, and line the city's entryway with cross after cross after cross, reminding people if this is the course of life that you choose, this is the fate that awaits you. Death. Jesus picks up that same language in verse 34. Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and die and follow after me. Jesus isn't speaking of putting ourselves to death here physically, but he's talking about giving our lives over to him. Notice what follows it. Follow me. Verse 35. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's will save it. Think about how much money and how many man hours a year are put into saving life. And really not even saving life, but just pushing back that day of death by a matter of a few weeks, a few months, a few years. How many billions, if not trillions of dollars are spent just in our country yearly on that? Seeking to save our lives. But the paradigm of Scripture is different. This paradigm that Jesus provides completely changes our interactions with the world and our estimation of the world around us. Jesus tells his audience that losing our lives for him is the way to find true peace, true meaning, and true victory, verse 38. And that all comes not necessarily by staving off physical death, 
but by living in such a way so that physical death is not the enemy, but is the release. Uh, This past week, one of of the two elders that I first lived under as a Christian passed away after a long battle with a degenerative brain condition. But the the grief from so many of us wasn't there. And it was a beautiful thing. There wasn't a one of us who was sad for him. His name was Bill Crow. Not a one of us was sad for Bill. Because we know the kind of life that Bill led. He was a shepherd of God's people for years until his body wouldn't let him continue doing that anymore. His works follow after him. What a blessing to be able to rejoice with his family over his great hope because of the grace offered him through Jesus Christ and his faithful response to that grace. This is what the gospel does. This is the good news of the gospel. So much of our society looks at death as something to fear. But it's going to happen to everybody. The gospel takes this one commonality of all of humanity and says, you don't have to fear this, you can embrace this. That changes everything. To the Christian, then, death is not a moment to run from in fear, but a moment to embrace in confidence and joy. It is a moment of transition, greatest moment of bliss we will ever know. That's good news. The moment the majority of humanity fears so much is the moment that we don't have to fear. But is the moment we're at peace and we're going home finally. What a blessing that is. Look at Luke chapter 4. That sort of a perspective and that sort of a life. It's what Jesus is describing here in Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, Jesus here in the synagogue in Nazareth, the city where he had been brought up. And in verse 17, he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. So this is a passage Jesus deliberately went to while reading in the synagogue. He deliberately goes here to Isaiah, chapter 61, and he reads this in the presence of all, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of our Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. So he stands and reads from the book. This would have been common Jewish tradition. Then he sits down. This would have been the position of the one who was going to explain the law. And here is Jesus going to sit down and explain Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. And so everyone's eyes are tuned. Everyone's ears are focused in on Jesus. He's going to explain this to us. And what does he say? To the shock of everyone that is there, he says what? Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Can you imagine? Can you imagine that response? And he kept on talking. Don't think that that was all of Jesus' sermon, just like this is not all of mine. But they all bore witness to him in verse 22 and marveled at the notice, gracious words. That proceeded out of his mouth. He promised wealth and release and sight and freedom. But then he said, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. You know what that tells us? That that the wealth and release and sight and freedom that Jesus is talking about here 
is not physical. He wasn't talking about going down to the prison and opening the, the, the gates and literally letting the, the prisoners out of the prison. He wasn't talking literally about giving sight to the blind here, although he did that in other places. That's not his point here. He's talking spiritually here. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. That's what Jesus was bringing. When Jesus brought the gospel to people, this is the good news. When Jesus brought the gospel to people, this is what it resulted in. And people being wealthy, even though Paul says, I have suffered the loss of what? All things. Paul considered himself wealthy. Release and freedom, even though Paul and Silas and Peter and the apostles are all going to find themselves where? In prison, they were free. They're giving sight to the blind Saul who's blinded on the road to Damascus. He's going to receive his physical sight, but more than that, he's going to receive spiritual insight, isn't he? I am the Lord that you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goad. What's the good news of the gospel? The gospel gives us wealth and sight and freedom. All of this we find in the gospel. And this is all that the world misses. If this life is only temporary and there is something greater and more enduring beyond this life, then the earthly ways of judging blessings and the good life are inherently flawed because they miss the deeper reality of eternity. Through Jesus and his message in the gospel, we find wealth and freedom and sight. We appreciate this when we keep the world in its proper perspective, and we appreciate this when we keep Jesus as the focus of our lives. Fixing Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. The good news of the gospel is that we can be wealthy, we can be released, we can be free, we can have sight, and that's all spiritual. That no one can take away from us except ourselves. That's the good news of the gospel. Look at Mark chapter 16 and verse 15. The good news of the gospel is that it's a common message for everybody. Doesn't matter what you look like. Doesn't matter where you came from. Doesn't matter the circumstances you grew up in. Doesn't matter what other people have said about you. Doesn't matter what your past experiences are. Doesn't matter how many skeletons you have in your closet. Doesn't matter how much sin you've committed. The good news of the gospel is that it's for you too. It's for me, it's for you, it's for everybody. Jesus has raised from the dead. He's giving instructions to his disciples in this last period of his life on the earth. And as he is sending out his apostles, he says to them what? Go into all the world. Preach the gospel to every creature. Here's the good news of the gospel. It's for everybody. It's the same standard, the same message, the same Lord, the same faith, the same baptism, the same body. It's for everybody. Just like death is the great uniter, so is the gospel. It can bring together folks from all sorts of different backgrounds, from all sorts of different cultures, from all sorts of different perspectives. Here's the gospel. The good news of the gospel is it's for everybody because everybody needs the gospel. Why does everybody need the gospel? Because everybody who can understand what I'm saying, we've had experience with sin, haven't we? And most likely all of us have given in to sin at some point. Every one of us who are Christians in this room have given in sin at some point. In fact, that's the reason we became Christians, isn't it? Because sin had come into our lives. And we needed something to free us from that. So here's the good news of the gospel. Those bad choices that we made, those poor choices that we made, those sinful choices that we made, there's freedom from those just like Jesus promised. 
and the freedom from those promises, the freedom from that sin, is found in Jesus. And we learn of Jesus where? The good news of the gospel. Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. Do you want to be saved? Do you want to be saved from sin? Do you want to embrace the good news that the gospel has to share? The good news of salvation in Jesus Christ? If you believe in Jesus and believe in the gospel, will you put him on in baptism? Dying to that old life of sin? Raising up to this new life to follow Jesus, to take up the cross and follow after him like we read about earlier? If you're willing to do that this morning, we're ready to help you to experience that salvation at the hand of Jesus. Maybe as a Christian, you look at your life and haven't been living as you should, and you want to change. You want to come back to this good news of the gospel. If we can help you make any change in your life this morning, just let us know by coming while we stand. Good morning. It has been four or five weeks since we uh, presented Travis Besselman before you, the congregation, for your consideration in deciding uh, and assessing whether or not you thought it appropriate for him to begin serving this congregation uh, as an elder. And the feedback we have received from you has been positive, and so we conclude that you, along with Kent and Todd and myself all understand and believe that Travis is indeed qualified to serve in this role according to what we find in uh, 1 Timothy 3 and Titus chapter 1. Uh, we also want to let you know that the elders, we look forward uh, to Travis in his approach to this role being able to provide a balance that we think the three of us need. And so we're looking forward uh, to serving with him and him serving with us as an elder, as a bishop, as a pastor of this local work. And we want to thank you again for your dedication and your commitment to ensuring that this congregation is properly and scripturally organized. And we also, we trust that, uh, we trust that you will uh, continue to encourage us, that you will purpose to encourage Travis as he undertakes this role, uh, as you have encouraged us by being a group of Christians at this local work who are easy to lead. Uh, in talking with Travis, it is no surprise to me and to any of you, I would expect that Travis is going to pledge the very best that he has to offer, and we would ask that each and every one of us pledge our best to him as he uh, fulfills this role. We thank you for your attention. Welcome, Travis.